testimony If I have anything at all No one ever cared for me like Jesus His faithful hand has held me all this way when I'm old and gray and all my days are numbered on the earth, let it be known in you alone my joy was found. Let my children tell their children Rhythms are everywhere. Our Creator fills our lives with them and sustains all of His creation with healthy rhythms designed to expand life and replenish life. 
From the beating of our hearts within us to the changing of the seasons around us, all of life moves forward on God's timeline and on God's rhythms. But has it occurred to you that God's growth in your life also operates on rhythms? That all of your life will unfold in God-ordained seasons, each to be enjoyed and each one preparing us for the next. Discover God's rhythms, His unfolding grace for each new challenge and transition of life. Savor this season and strengthen the next. to join me in in John chapter 15, and we're going to get to that text in just a moment. Um, We are studying rhythms, how God ebbs and flows in our lives, in seasonal patterns, and in recurring ways. And it might seem like a, um, it might seem almost like a punishment to be talking about spring this week. As I look at the weather, there's actually some ice and snow on the schedule, it looks like. Um, But we can all look forward, and hopefully this will cultivate your heart today. Last week, we laid the groundwork of what is the experience of spring, what is God doing in our lives when spring returns, and today we're going to talk about how to cultivate it. How do we engage what God is doing in spring? Like we talked about God's work in winter, God has a work in spring to do as well. It's not going to be long. You know, I look out at this parking lot right now, and it's got piles of snow, and say, I hate the sand and the salt, you know, it gets all over the cars and it just makes everything look dirty. But they dump the sand all over the parking lot. It's not too long from now uh, before that snow is going to be gone. And the crew that comes out and takes care of our snow removal and our lawns, they're going to come out here one day with big blowers and they're going to be blowing all that sand and dirt into piles and then they're going to suction it all up and they're going to trim. You know, they're going to clean the whole property up. It'll just be like a thorough cleaning coming into spring. And they'll wait till that, you know, that last snow is gone, and then they'll start to clean everything up. And then something begins to happen. I kind of have, i got to be honest with you, when it comes to the parking lot, I have a love-hate relationship with spring. I love what spring does everywhere except for the parking lot. And that's because we have cracks in our parking lot. Any of you have cracks in your driveway? What's going to happen in the cracks in your driveway before too long? Somebody shout it out to me. Oh, my goodness. You're going to start seeing green grow where it's all supposed to be black asphalt. In fact, I came from a region of the country to Connecticut where things didn't grow naturally. So they only grew where you cultivated them to grow, unless you're talking tumbleweeds. They grew everywhere. But real stuff like flowers and green, nothing green grew unless you intentionally planted it, watered it, and more importantly, probably uh, wired up an automatic watering system to keep it alive and sustain it. Pretty much other than that, it was sand. It was, and if you stopped watering your lawn before long, it was br- brown and dead, and, and it, it too would eventually return to just be a dirt lot with, with uh, tumbleweeds growing. I wasn't prepared for the explosion that spring is in New England. In fact, I remember the first time I ever visited Emmanuel Christian Academy, I thought, I wish I had a weed whacker right now. I want to get out of the car and weed whack this place. And then I realized once I lived here, oh, everything is like that. You know, like right now, New England seems dead. In a few months, it'll just seem like the whole place needs a big haircut. Really. Your driveway, your sidewalks, your yard. Uh, everything will need to be trimmed. Why? Because of the explosion of life. I, 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 I truly have a, a love-hate relationship with what grows up in those cracks. And you can ask Pastor Sherwin because he helps manage our facilities. And like every other day, I'm like, Sherwin, there's a green weed right there. Get somebody to get that up. We got a weed whack. Hire a teenager to weed whack. Get some Roundup. Spray those cracks. I mean, I am like... I'm like Thanos to weeds between the cracks, okay? And if you're not into the Marvel Universe, you you don't know what I'm talking about. I am am just, I want all of the weeds gone out of the cracks right now. I want to snap my fingers and all of them be gone, you know? Um, So we are just very aggressive on the weeds. But in reality, we are just weeks away from that explosion of life. And, And a few introductory thoughts I want to share with you. When God brings spring, nothing really can hold back the explosion of life that he intends to bring. 
and in the winters of our lives, we can look forward to the return of spring. That's, that's really the whole essence of where we're at right now. And one of the early things I want to say here is, when it comes, welcome it. I'm going to say, I'm going to caveat this. Welcome it, but don't worship it. Welcome it. We can get it in the mindset, kind of two extremes. One extreme is, life is supposed to be hard, uh, and, and if it's hard, I'm enduring, I'm suffering, I'm paying the price, and we can find some sort of self-satisfaction in that. Like, I'm suffering for the Lord, and I'm enduring for God, um, and, and, and that's not really a healthy, long-term mindset. The other extreme is that if life is hard, I've done something wrong, and we begin to worship pleasure and safety and comfort, and we lose the sense that, no, God brings new life. God takes us out of winter into, new, into a new season to bear new fruit. And so we want to cultivate it. We want to welcome it. We want to steward it well. We want to embrace whatever rhythm God is unfolding in our lives and accept it. We want to reckon with it, but we don't want to, we want to be held through it, but not held by it. Okay. Um, and spring is a dangerous time when God brings fresh energy and fresh life and, and resurges new vitality into your heart and life. It's a dangerous time. Uh, like winter can tend to crush you and flatten you with that living, walking death feeling of, I don't have the energy or the strength. Spring brings kind of an alternate temptation. Spring brings a temptation to leave God behind. I've got new blessings and new opportunities and new dreams to pursue, and I've got new energy and fresh life. I've turned a new page. I've entered a new season in my life. Oh, I'm good now. Here's the thing. In winter, we know we need God. <laughs> and so if we're not disillusioned with him, we, we just fall onto him, independence. But spring can give us this subtle sense that maybe I'm okay. And all of a sudden, we can translate that, even subconsciously, into maybe I don't need him as much as I thought I needed him. And so it, it is an awesome time. It's an exciting time. It's a welcome time, but it's a, a little bit of a dangerous time. Um, Jesus, in John 15, I, I, I think next year we're going to go verse by verse through the book of John. Now, don't hold me to that, but I'm really praying about next January already in terms of sermon series. John 14, 15, 16, 17 is the day, the night, the evening before Jesus is crucified. And the last eight months or so of Jesus' ministry, his message transitioned from purely a gospel, believe, believe me message, believe in me message, to a discipleship, follow me, um, here's what discipleship will cost, uh, preparing his followers for disappointment, preparing them for the story to shift underneath their feet uh, um, in ways they weren't expecting or they weren't quite prepared for. They didn't, they didn't want him to die. They didn't want to hear him talk of it. They rebuked him when he talked about it. They didn't totally comprehend what he was even getting at. I'm going away. I'm giving you the comforter. Um, and, and all of this passage is Jesus teaching his followers at this pivotal, critical, vital moment. Okay, They're getting ready to go through a short winter. And then when you turn the page to the book of Acts 1 and 2 and 3, spring is going to explode, okay? They're going to have new life, new power. The Spirit of God is going to fill them, come upon them. Pentecost, Jerusalem, 3,000 believers. A few days later, 5,000 believers. The church is going to explode in new life and new energy. And so what Jesus is telling them right now is really how to navigate spring. These instructions in John 15 are really about spring. They're springtime instructions. So let's read. I only put a couple verses in your outline, so I want you to turn to it in your actual physical Bible or in your app with me. And I want to read the first part of John 15. And I pray today that this will nourish you and me because we all need this. We all need to get ready for spring. And I'm not talking about weather. I'm talking about life. Jesus speaking, the eve of his death, preparing his followers 
as they're getting ready to enter a real dark night, he's going to tell them, spring is coming, and here's where you, how you need to be ready for spring. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. That's the gospel. We're clean by the gospel. We're purified. We're saved. We're brought into Jesus by these gospel words that he's been teaching all this time. Now, verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. So once I pray and trust Christ, he's in me. I'm placed into him. But Jesus continually uses this word, abide, abide, abide. Okay, we're going to come back to it. Abide in me. It's a choice that I have to make. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Read verse 5 out loud with me. Ready? Go. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. I'll continue. If a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. So Jesus lays the groundwork here of what spring is like and how his followers should anticipate behaving to navigate spring carefully and wisely to steward spring. You see, in spring, life has ceased to be hard, but it has become ex extremely strategic. What I do with this new life, what I do with this springtime, how, how I steward it, how will I um, invest the new energy, the fresh strength, how will I cultivate the new growth and the forward momentum? The question essentially is, who will I become in spring? Who will I be as I as I seize these new opportunities, as I enjoy new dreams. Um, Haley, my daughter Haley is 20, and she'll be married in a few months, or six, uh, I don't even want to count the months, so don't ask. Um, and I've been thinking this past week about when she was in my wife's womb. It was one of the hardest winters of our lives, primarily Dana more than me. I, I realize that, and I'm not claiming to be the victim of, of all these things as much as Dana was, but walking with her through this was really hard. Um, Haley wanted to be born when she was it, about three months along, maybe, maybe three and a half or something. And Dana started having early contractions, which was common for her throughout pregnancies, and she had had many miscarriages over the course of our marriage. Um, and so we were, we were naturally fearful and worried that this would, you know, happen again. So when she started having contractions, we told the doctor, and the doctors, you know, told her bed rest. That was the first way they dealt with it is bed rest. So suddenly, oh my goodness, you know, my wife is basically incapacitated, and the, and, and, and the burden is on me to fix the meals and do the laundry, and, and, and basically she's got to sit in bed or sit on the couch as much and as long as possible every day. She's immobilized. And and you have this, this, it's a burden, but it's also this, you know, this growing sense. You're protecting this life that's, that's so fragile in this womb. And Dana sat there for weeks and weeks um, in bed or on the couch and really moved as minimally as possible. We, we, we counted the weeks and we were really eager to resume some normal operation uh, to our family. I was eager to take her out to dinner, to take a walk, just to do anything mobile. And our doctors um, locally had said, you know, at the, I forget what week it was, but they had given us a certain week that at that week, uh, she, she crosses that survival question mark, that survival threshold, and we'll probably let you off bed rest and, and, and all these things. Well, that day came, and uh, we were so excited we anticipated she had an appointment about an, uh, in, in a further away uh, OBGYN specialty kind of um, 
labor and delivery you know, center for the Kaiser system in, in Southern California. We had to drive about an hour, hour and a half to that appointment, but that was the first time she ever got to leave the house in months. And we were so excited that she was going to get off bed rest. That's what we were anticipating is going in, seeing this doctor, doing the ultrasound, all that. And they're going to say, okay, you're good to go. You can come off bed rest. So we actually went out to lunch. It was like our first date before the appointment. And we were so, you know, just, just so happy, like being set free from prison almost. We got to the hospital. Uh, the doctor's name was Schmidt. She was a German lady and she was tough as nails. And she was the senior labor and delivery doctor for the entire Kaiser system. She was, she was the boss of everybody. So we knew we were talking to the, to the, to the most experienced mind and, and, and eyes you know, that would look at the details. And we got into that meeting, that office, and she got Dana laid out on that table with that ultrasound. And, and as she put the ultrasound on Dana's tummy, Dana's tummy was was contracting. It was solid. And she felt that. And she looked at Dana. She said, are you having a contraction right now? And Dana said, yeah, I have them all the time. And the doctor said, oh my, we have to stop that. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> where's this going? And she said, we've got to stop that. And she started you know, doing the ultrasound and Haley was safe. Haley was healthy. Heartbeat was good. But she said, you can't leave this hospital having contractions. And I looked at the doctor, I said, wait, we were coming here for you to tell us she, she can come off bed rest because now we're past that threshold, that safe zone. She said, oh, sir, don't, you know, don't be confused. Yeah, the baby would survive right now, but do you want your baby to be in the NICU for three, four months or longer? She said, every day this baby's in this womb, She's, health, she's growing healthier, her immune system, her lungs, all of these things are coming to form and she's nowhere near ready to be outside of this womb. We can't ever, we can't possibly take that risk at this stage. And I, I mean, our hopes were absolutely deflated. We thought spring was coming and it wasn't. And we were put back on hold. The doctor actually said, I can't let you leave the hospital. You have to be checked in. You have to be admitted. We were incredulous, oh my goodness. I mean, what we, it was the polar opposite of what we expected to hear that day. We didn't have a suitcase, not one stitch of clothing or anything had, had, was prepared. We, didn't, we weren't prepared for Dana to stay in the hospital an hour and a half from home. It was just, well, they took her from that table into um, the, uh, the, the ward where, where all the preterm labor ladies were. They hooked her up immediately to an IV and they put her on some kind of medicine that within about 30 minutes, she was like on fire. I mean, her, I don't know the name of the medicine. There's probably nurses in the room that could tell us what it was. I want to say Pitocin, but it may have been worse than Pitocin. I can't remember. All I know, it was at the time the most extreme way that they, that they get the womb to relax. And I'm sitting there and I'm actually kind of, Dana's suffering. I mean, suffering. She was suffering. And the nurses were coming and going, and, and finally one of the doctors came in, and I said, what's going on? And the lady said, what do you mean? And I said, they told us at our other doctor that this was the day she could be off bed rest, and we were kind of going to be set free, and we come here, and you guys are, are more panicked than anybody has been up to this point, and I just don't understand it. And I got a little bit, a little bit frustrated. You ever get that way? And the doctor looked at me, and she, she got a little perturbed with me. She stood up straight. This isn't Dr. Schmidt. This was one of her well-trained militant officers. Um, and that doctor looked at me and she said, Mr. Schmidt, listen to me right now. And Dana's, I mean, Dana's suffering. And, and, and she, she got her finger in my face and she said, every day this baby is in this womb, saves probably a week in the NICU. She said, I know your wife is suffering. But this is what it takes to save your daughter's life. And we know what we're doing. Trust us. And then she said this. After this baby is born, you won't even remember this happened. I mean, she rebuked me. I thought she was going to slap me. <laughs> so, so I just at that point zipped my lip, said, yes, ma'am. She said, and your job is to comfort your wife while she's suffering. And this will pass and we'll get this under control, but right now we need you to cooperate. I said, yes, ma'am. Thank you for the assurance. Well, 
Uh, Dana came through those moments. They admitted her. I went back to the house, got her stuff, brought it back down. And so it began, I can't even remember, Dana can tell you, three, four weeks of her being in bed in the hospital. And I remember driving every day. I'd work a half a day and then drive down and stay, sit with her through the day and evening. We'd watch a television show. Somewhere around 8 o'clock, I'd drive back home. And, and I remember the day that um, she called me. I was home. I just got home. I'd slept in the chair next to her all night. And I went home for an event at the church. And the doctor called me, or she called me, and she said, Hey, she said, the doctor said uh, it's time to do an emergency C-section. And now we were well into the safe zone. They had given shots. Haley's lungs had improved. She was ready to be born. And I was right in the middle of a big event at the church with, with a couple thousand teenagers on site. And uh, I remember being on the platform and somebody brought me the phone and said, hey, or they were waving at me, come talk to your wife on the phone. And uh, so I grabbed that phone and she said, get back down here. I said, are they taking you in right now or do I have time to get there? She said, no, no, they're going to wait for you. I said, okay, I'll be right there. I rushed home. I changed clothes. I grabbed my stuff. I... I made a beeline an hour and a half down to, uh, to Woodland Hills in Southern California and got there just in time, and they prepped. They took us into surgery, and I'm sitting there by Dana's face as they, as they operate, and, uh, and I'll never forget them handing Haley over to Dana, bringing her around. She couldn't hold her. She was all you know geared up and all the stuff, but, but she could see her face. They showed her to me, and they rushed her off to the NICU, and they took Dana into uh, recovery, and I was kind of there. And nobody was there. Just me. My wife's in recovery. My new daughter's in the NICU. And I just thought, what am I going to do right now? And I went to BJ's, which is a restaurant. I was hungry. <laughs> this is what men do when they're alone. I'm hungry. I want a sandwich. I sat down in the booth alone. Waitress came over and she said, Can I help you? I said, Yes. I'm celebrating. She said, what are you celebrating? I said, I have a new daughter. And uh, Hazer said, congratulations. I said, so I just want the biggest meal you have. Like, tell me what the biggest meal is. You know, and I got barbecue something or other and corn. I just, I ate and ate and ate and sat there for an hour and a half, just stopping and letting it sink in. I have a daughter. And I'll tell you what, Dana and I totally forgot what was happening in winter. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me. Uh-oh. I have a daughter. <laughs> the yay moment turned into a new opportunity, a new responsibility. This is what I want you to have a sense of today. Spring is a yay time, but it's also a strategic time. Spring is, a, is a, a cultivating time of how do I steward and cultivate? How do I nurture this growth so that I can be bearing the fruit that Jesus wants me to bear? And I want you to consider three principles of navigating, cultivating, seizing the responsibility that spring is. You don't want to get into summer with everything overgrown. And, and not really strategically bearing fruit. You don't want to meet the Jesus having wasted spring and wasted summer and the fruit and the harvest that he wanted to bring in your life. And so what do we do so that we can bear the fruit Jesus calls us to bear? Number one, <laughs> we renew our grip on Jesus. And this is all about what Jesus is talking about, abiding and following. Now, there's an Old Testament passage I gave you, God through Moses, is preparing the second generation of Israelites to move from the wilderness into the promised land. Spring is about to blossom for the Israelites. They're about to go from the desert of Sinai to the flourishing milk and honey, land flowing with milk and honey and, and grapes and, 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 and fruit abounding, and not just Literally, but metaphorically. They're going to conquer this land. They're going to divide up this land. They're going to uh, settle this land. It's going to become a country. There's going to be generations of fruitfulness. And Moses' instructions were to them, uh, God's instructions, hearken diligently unto my commandments. God says, if you hearken diligently unto my commandments, 
that I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in its due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle that thou mayest eat and be full. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Now, I want you to see the heart of God is the same in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and it's been the same over thousands of years and dozens of centuries. It hasn't changed. Thousands of years ago, God was saying to people coming out of winter into spring, take heed, grab a hold, grab a hold of my word and my commands because my commands bring health. My commands bring fruitfulness. What he's saying is make sure you go into spring with my directives, my instructions. Do spring my way, God's saying. Why? Because he knows there's a danger that we will do spring our way. That we'll take our energy and our resources and our opportunities and run fast and hard from him instead of letting his work unfold his way cleaving to him, abiding in him, following him, obeying him. Look at verse 16 of Deuteronomy 11. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and that you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. I want to say to you as we come into spring, not just weather-wise, but in your life, when spring arrives, be careful that in enjoying new strength, you don't worship the expression of that strength. Be careful that in being safe, you don't worship safety. Be careful that in earning money, you don't worship materialism. Be careful that enjoying blessings, you do not worship pleasure. Be careful that in pursuing new dreams, you don't come to worship those dreams or worship that individualism. The warning from God in Deuteronomy is the same as Jesus in John 15. Look at it again. Abide, Jesus says. That means to stay, to dwell, to endure in me and I in you. Jesus says you can't bear fruit apart from me. This is the way this works. When Jesus wanted his followers to understand Acts 1 and 2 and 3, the spring that was about to explode, he's going to say to them, here's his understanding and how he wanted to explain it to them. I'm like a vine. They would have all understood this. They were surrounded by vineyards. They were surrounded by fruitfulness. They understood what a vine looked like and what branches looked like. And basically he said, you're like a vineyard and my father is like the husbandman. He's the one that's tending and cultivating and planting and and, and nurturing the vineyard. And I'm the vine. I'm the, the root and the stalk. I'm the one that brings all the nutrients to bear in your life. And you've been grafted into me as a branch by faith. We know this to be the gospel. We know this to be our salvation. We're placed into Jesus and he's placed into us. We're made one. We're grafted in. And Jesus says, so here's the deal. The branches cannot bear fruit on their own. If they disconnect from the vine, they're going to shrivel up and die. So Jesus says, your only hope to be who I've called you to be, to enjoy the abundance that I want to give you, and bless you with is that you stay connected, that you hold on to me and hold on to my words and let my truth and my commands guide you and let my presence fill you, let my spirit empower you. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, the same bringeth forth much fruit. I read this past week a chapter in Max Lucado's book, several chapters actually, uh, called Jesus. Great book. I just encourage you to grab it. It's, it's, it'll just nourish your soul. But there's a chapter in that book called I Am the Vine. And I want to read you a quote of the way Lucato describes this because it so blessed me. The Father tends, Jesus nourishes, we receive, and grapes appear. Passerby, stunned at the overflowing baskets of love and grace and peace, can't help but ask, who runs this vineyard? And God is honored. For this reason, fruit-bearing matters to God. And it matters to you. 
You grow weary of unrest. You're ready to be done with sleepless nights. You long for the fruit of the Spirit. But how do you bear this fruit? Try harder? No. Hang tighter. Our assignment is not fruitfulness, but faithfulness. The secret to fruit bearing and anxiety free living is less about doing and more about abiding. Come live in me, Jesus invites. Make my home your home. Odds are you know what it means to be at home somewhere. To be at home is to feel safe. The residence is a place of refuge and security. To be at home is to be comfortable. You can pat around wearing slippers and a robe. To be at home is to be familiar. When you enter the door, you needn't consult the blueprint to find the kitchen. Our aim, our only aim, is to be at home in Jesus. He is not a roadside park or a hotel room. He is our permanent mailing address. Christ is our home. He is our place of refuge and security. We are comfortable in his presence, free to be our authentic selves. We know our way around in him. We know his heart and his ways. We we rest in him, find our nourishment in him. His roof of grace protects us from storms and guilt. His walls of providence secure us from destructive winds. His fireplace warms us during lonely winters of life. We linger in the abode of Christ and never leave. The branch never releases the vine, ever. Does a branch show up on Sundays for its once a week meal? Only at the risk of death. The healthy branch never releases the vine. To do so would interrupt the flow of essential nutrients. So so Jesus' first instruction as we come into winter is hold on to me. Let me grow the fruit I want to grow. The Old Testament view of it was follow my commands, grab a hold of my instructions, bury your heart in doing this God's way and wait and see what God is going to do. I'll never forget taking my family to a mall in Southern California one Christmas many years ago. The kids were little. Haley was a baby in a stroller. The boys were just barely old enough to walk around the mall with us and, uh, and maybe a little older than that. And uh, we got into that mall at Christmas time. I don't know what we were thinking. We were coming back from a fun day away, and we, th- we were looking for a place to eat. And I said, hey, it's Christmas. Let's go to the mall. It's always fun to go to the mall around Christmas time. We picked the wrong mall at the wrong time in the wrong place. I'm telling you, it was the Glendale Galleria. It's one of the biggest malls in Southern California. And it, it, everybody sent out an email that day saying, come shopping tonight, because we got to that Galleria, and it was smashed with people. I mean, there... The, we still needed to eat. Otherwise, I would have just gotten in the car and gone home. We needed food. But we got into that mall, and as soon as we walked in the door, I just kind of panicked. Like, I've got three little kids and a wife. How do we keep them together in this massive rush of people? And you know what we did? I said, grab a hold, everybody. Everybody grab mom's and dad's hands and stay close to us because we're going to get through this crowd. The Schmidt family mission, we're going to find food. But hold on tight. And so um, that's Jesus' instruction to you at spring. Hold on tight. There's going to be some great fruit in your life, but don't let go. Spring tempts you to let go. Spring tempts you to kind of walk your own way. But, but Jesus warned us not to do that. Secondly, very quickly, resume your ministry in Jesus' vineyard. Resume your ministry in Jesus' vineyard. And the metaphor switches at this point in the message on purpose Because Ecclesiastes 3, Solomon said, to everything there's a season, a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. The planting effort is what I want to talk about right now. Ecclesiastes 11 is what speaks to this. The expending of our lives, the planting of our lives in ways that are multiplication-oriented. And Solomon in Ecclesiastes 11 gives a lot of metaphors, but he begins with this phrase, cast your bread upon the waters, thou shalt find it after many days. Then he switches the metaphor to to verse 3, if clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. I'm going to come back and explain these metaphors very quickly. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. He that observeth the wind shall not sow. He that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. Verse 6, in the morning sow thy seed, 
and in the evening withhold not thy hand, for thou knowest not whether it shall prosper either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. What is Solomon teaching us in Ecclesiastes 11? He's teaching us about life, and he's explaining that in, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it into our metaphor, the spring times of life, the planting times of life, are times where we strategically expend. We strategically give. We strategically invest. There are financial principles here, but they're not only financial, they're life principles. Because you don't just spend money, you spend time. You spend energy. You spend a lot of things in your life. You guys with me? Okay, we spend a lot of things. And Solomon's saying, yeah, you're gonna spend your life. And one of the first things he's, he's, he's speaking against right here is not spending it. Because there is a part of us that, that, and we have a culture that idolizes, worships, is addicted to safety and comfort. And this is a, a bit of a subjective line that I'm gonna talk about right now. But somewhere between brash, thoughtless, careless, foolishness on one extreme and um, ridiculous um, fear and anxiety um, and I'm never going to leave my house again thinking, somewhere in the middle of that, every one of us has to reckon with this. At, at what point does following, uh, at what point is risk reasonable again? I'm not going to try to attempt to answer that question because if there's 800 or 1,000 people in our church, there's 1,000 different answers, okay? Um, so I'm not, I'm not speaking judgmentally. I've got to answer that question for myself. Um, Pre-COVID, we went shopping. We went to restaurants. We, we traveled. We flew on airplanes. Uh, it appears that this year there will be some sort of return to risk factor, you know, the, a, a normal risk factor. At some point, I don't know when, and for everybody, it might be a different place. But at some point, I've got to reckon with this. God hasn't called me to safety. He's called me to mission. Again, I'm not speaking to being irrational or thoughtless or careless. But at some point, we're all called to live. At some point, you know, I've had to reckon with this all year long. And, and it was, it's easy for me to make the decision for me. That's why I've never tried to make a decision for anybody in our church, and I won't. I can make the decision for me. Um, there, there, I've placed myself in lots of positions and lots of situations that others, others for me would have said, don't do that. That's dangerous. You're risking yourself. But I've got, I've got to weigh this. At what point do I obey God in my call versus just sitting around trying to stay alive? And that's kind of what Solomon is dealing with here. He's saying, live your life. Cast your bread upon the waters is an investing term. He's saying, get your grain out onto multiple ships. Get your commerce flowing multiple directions. Diversify. Invest your life strategically. And you don't know wh where it's going to be the most profitable. But pour yourself into as many opportunities as God would give you. Again, not simply financially, but in every way. And then he says, clouds were made to rain. That's verse 3. In other words, clouds are not designed to just hold water indefinitely. It's a cycle. The water comes in, and the water is designed to be poured out. And a cloud was designed by God to expend itself. Why? To nourish the earth, to grow fruit. And you're a cloud, and I'm a cloud. And i got to be honest with you, in many respects, COVID has kept us holding in the rain. Hopefully not. I don't know your life. I don't know your schedule this week. I don't know how and who. I don't know how you're serving Jesus at this time. I'm just speaking kind of comprehensively. Maybe the globe, maybe the American church. I'm not sure. But of necessity this year, the American church had to turn inward and go, how do we, how do we be safe? That was a foreign concept to the first century church. I think, it's, I think it bears considering. I, that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying what you should do. I'm saying we, we have a choice to make this year as a church. As the fear factors start to dissipate, as the vaccine starts to 
you know, be more accessible as health hopefully prayerfully returns to some level of normal, will we? Will I? Will I once again be willing to be a cloud willing to rain? <laughs> he, that obser- he that observeth, oh, the tree image is, is simply this, where he says a tree is gonna fall, if it falls to the north or the south or the east, it's good, there it will be. What he says is you're a tree. And you got a time to bear fruit. You got a time to dig roots and bear fruit. But one day, you're going to fall. And once you've fallen, whatever direction you decide to fall, that's where you're going to be. The idea is live your life while you can, plant your seed while you can, bear your fruit while you can, and choose strategically which direction you're going to bear fruit in. Choose your definition of success. My definition is obedience to my God. Choose your definition of success because you're a tree falling. And one day, you're going to land and none of it can be redone. It'll all be in the books. And you'll just, your tree will have landed. Okay? Um, So he says, we observe the wind. He that observeth the wind shall not sow. He that regardeth the cloud shall not reap. What's he saying? If we look at the risk, we're not going to do anything. If we look at, oh, it might rain today, I'm not going to plan. Oh, I might, or this might happen, I'm not going to invest. Oh, I might get ridiculed, I'm not going to share the gospel. Oh, I might, and, and we live in a culture that's telling us, don't take any risks ever, ever. And I, for one, cannot live that way because that is not living. I refuse to live that way. Now, let me caveat what I'm saying. I'm not taking responsibility for what risk you take. You take the risk you're comfortable taking with God. You don't answer to me, you answer to God. You're worshiping online, I'm I'm thankful you are. Do it as long as you need to. Don't hear pressure from me. Hear your pastor not pressuring you. Hear your pastor encouraging you to go to your God and really evaluate what kind of cloud are you gonna be? Where are you gonna fall as a tree? How will you resume ministry in the vineyard God's given you to minister in. Third principle, very quickly. Reset your journey in Jesus' clarity. There's a cleaning and purging aspect to spring. Well, the the first thought about renewing our grip was about abiding and following. And the second thought about resuming our ministry is about plowing and planting. That's the imagery. This third image is about cleaning and purging, resetting your journey in clarity. And I take you to Hebrews 12 for this one, and these are topical thoughts. Hope you'll forgive me for that. I usually like to just go right through a passage. Wherefore, Hebrews 12 says, seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, the witnesses of Hebrews 12. I always envision this like a stadium of people cheering, looking over the edge of heaven, cheering us on. I'm not saying that's a, I'm not gonna say that's the wrong way to see this. It's just um, not exactly the most It's not exactly the essence of it. The essence of it is this. The chapter before it is all the people that live by faith. It's the great faith hall of fame. And what he's doing is it's a courtroom. And the author of Hebrews is proving Jesus to the courtroom, to the jury, okay? He's proving that Jesus was God, that Jesus fulfilled all the Old Testament sacrificial system. That's what the book of Hebrews is about. He's proving to first century Jewish believers that they don't have to go back to Judaism, that they could follow Jesus alone. And he doesn't want them to fall away from Jesus. And their faith is what's gonna keep them intact in spite of trials, hardship, risk, suffering, death, martyrdom, all of it, okay? Um... And and so he says, because we are surrounded by this great cloud of proof cases, witnesses, all of these people would stand in the court, come to the witness stand, and testify to the faithfulness of God through their trials, through their hardship, through their risk, and glad they took the risk to trust God. All of them would stand to, 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 to testify, to witness to the reliability of our faith on this journey of following God. And so he says, because of these witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. I don't know if you track this. All three points 
All three passages reference the idea of being knocked off course. One is idolatry. One is just withdrawing, disconnecting from Jesus, not abiding. This one is being laden down with things we can't run in or run with or run well through life spiritually. It all kind of hones in on the same idea that we can be knocked off course in spring. When we should be running, we're, we're tripped, we're flattened. We're, we're off course. We're weighed down by what built, I don't know if you've noticed this, winter has a way of building things up. <laughs> right here, <laughs> downstairs in the basement, stuff just grows, you know. We eat a lot of, I eat a lot of sweet stuff in winter, comfort food, I guess, you know, pasta and bread, and oh my goodness, I'm getting hungry just thinking about it. Extra weight, extra stuff, and what do you do? I know Dana does this, when spring breaks, boy, I'll come home one day, all of a sudden all the windows of the house will be open. The breeze will be blowing through, she'll be vacuuming every corner and cobweb, and, and there'll be extra bags of trash, and I mean, just all of a sudden you wanna clean out things. Why? Because the beautiful part of the year you want to kind of get ready for. And you you want to you want to be able to enjoy it. You want to run light. Spring is a season to run, so it's a season to shed that which hinders my running. So one of the ways we steward spring is we 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 ask ourselves what's slowing me down, what's distracting me, what has crept into my life unawares and has kind of grown and surged and and become present, and I got to get rid of it. When I was a kid growing up in Georgia, a teenager, a young teenager, um, we lived way out in the country. And we would drive out this two-lane country road, and all along the sides of the road, there was this vine, there still is, that grows in that part of the world called kudzu. K-U-D-Z-U, K-U-D-Z-U. It's actually from Asia. It was transplanted to America in the late 1800s. In the early 1900s, it became like a thing that they were encouraging everybody to plant all around the South, that it was gonna revitalize homes and gardens and fields, and so they really spread it. But then it, then it became um, almost a mythical uh, threat because it grows so fast. Kudzu will grow out of control, like overnight. And I just remember this experience, and it's, it's, it's not so out of control now as it used to be. I just remember driving down the road to our house and driving down our long driveway, we had a long driveway, and you couldn't even see the trees. The kudzu had grown so much and overtaken things. And I just want to ask you a question. Do you go into spring with your spiritual life looking like that? Do you go into a new season of fruit bearing and health and vitality and following God with an overgrown life? And I hope you won't. I hope you will let God do the purging work that he wants to do. So, to review, renew your grip on Jesus. Resume your ministry. Be the cloud God called you to be. Reset your journey. Run with patience. Run light. Be willing for God to clean out and purge what needs to change so that you can run the race he's called you to run. Oh, I wish I had time to review with you uh, Paul's story in Athens and then going to Corinth and Thessalonica. We've been studying it in First Thessalonians. Paul went through a long winter when he left Thessalonica and went to Corinth. You can look it up for yourself in Acts 18. There was this moment, though, when his friends returned to Corinth with an offering and with good news. And the good news was the church at Thessalonica is doing great. And Paul's spirit was re-energized. The words used in Acts 18 was he was pressed in his spirit. The sense of it was not just that he was burdened, but that he was reignited, that he was he was repassioned by God. Now, church family, listen, and those of you online, listen, I know what God wants to, he's brought us through and is bringing us through a long winter. And I'm not talking about January, February, I'm talking about COVID. I pray, I anticipate, I don't know when and how, we'll feel and see spring coming. What I want us to take away from this as a church family is will we be ready for spring? Will we be ready when God shows up at Corinth with good news and, 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 and when, when, when he revitalizes, when he revives, when he repassions us? Will we be abiding? Will we be running light and ready to go for his glory? Because our mission has not changed. And I want to close with this thought, the best spring of all 
is the spring where you meet Jesus. And spring can start today for anybody that doesn't know Jesus. Jesus said, I am the vine, my father is the husband, every branch in me, every branch in me, what is that all about? It is about the fact that Jesus came to provide my redemption, to offer justice on my behalf. He became the substitutionary atonement for my sin. He faced a reckoning so that I could be reconciled to God. And when he comes into me, he called it new birth. Paul said, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature, spring. And if you have never been reconciled to God, if you're within the sound of my voice, you've never received, received the reconciling uh, work of Jesus on your behalf, then spring begins the moment you decide you want Jesus to save you. The moment you admit, I'm sinful and I need a savior, and Jesus is spring to me, and I want the new birth that only he can provide. And I would invite you to make that decision today. Friends, I don't know how this hit you. It hit me pretty hard this week. But I hope you will prayerfully renew your grip, retain your grip on Jesus. Resume the ministry he calls you to in whatever way that looks for you right now. And be prepared to reset your journey, to run the way Jesus calls you to run. Let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, thank you for this time. I pray that something I said will encourage my friends. Thank you for our church family. I pray that you would prepare us for spring. I pray that we'll celebrate spring. But more than that, I pray that we be very careful with spring to be faithful stewards in it. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior and you want to, I'd like to give you the opportunity. If you've never received the new birth and new life that he offers you, it's real simple. He says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The way you believe in Jesus is you place your trust in him by faith, in prayer. And that prayer would go something like this, and I would invite you to pray a similar prayer sincerely from your heart. It is not a repeat after me, recite, you know, recite these magic words. That's not the way this works. This is a decision of the heart. I'm simply helping you put words to your heart. If this is your heart, you pray, you cry out to God, he will answer this prayer. Jesus, between you and me, I admit that I'm sinful and broken. I'm guilty. In your courtroom, I'm guilty. And I realize I'm condemned. And I realize, admit, there's no way I can save myself. I can't bring new birth and new life into my own life. But Jesus, I believe I believe that you are God and that you died for me and rose again to offer me forgiveness and new birth and new life. And Jesus, I receive that right now. I'm asking you to come into my life and be my personal savior. Now, my friend, you only need to pray that prayer one time in your life. It is a one-time decision. It is a one-time birth. And you can never be unborn it is the gift of God's grace. And if that's your decision today, we have a Bible and a book, and it's in the white gift bag in the back. We hope you'll take it and celebrate and commemorate this day. If you're online, we will send you this, mail this to you, but we simply need to know about your decision. And so you could email me personally, and I will celebrate your decision, pastor at ebcnewington.com. Father, go with us today, strengthen us, encourage us, and take us forward by your grace. And thank you so much for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.